Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, share, support, and subscribe. You can subscribe wherever you hear this, be it Anchor or Transistor, Google, Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. You can support by going to patreon.com slash tawahado, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o, or signing up for the newsletter at aksum.substack.com, that's a-k-s-u-m dot substack.com, and you can share the link to where you found this, or you can share the very words that you hear with your loved ones, your friends, your family, strangers, and those who you consider your enemies. Today we are in the scroll of Revelation, the scroll of the Apocalypse, the scroll of Uncovering, chapter 11. We're reading from the King James Version to be friendly with the public domain. Verses 1 and 2. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. I can't hear rod without thinking of Proverbs, which is part of the Ketuvim, or the writings, the third section of the Hebrew Bible, and the famous phrase, or idiom that has made it into the English language that I think a lot of people misinterpret. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, here it is in all its KJV glory. He that spareth, this is Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. A lot of times we interpret this as a kind of green light for corporal punishment in order to beat children. But what we need to do, putting that argument aside for other venues, is to realize that that which rebukes and admonishes all of humankind and is especially important in our most formative years, if you take Dr. Maria Montessori to heart, that'll begin at something like 15 months or 18 months. If you take uh, organizations like City or Los Angeles to heart, then it'll be between around the ages that one should be in third grade to eighth grade, roughly about eight or nine years old till you're about 14 years old. In any event, in those time periods, whether it's at 15 or 18 months or whether it's third grade and ninth grade, if you're a parent, an older brother, older sister, older cousin, auntie, grandma, if you have any sort of relationship with people younger than you, use the word of God to instruct people younger than you unto life. That is the rod of God. That is the rod here of revelation and use the word of God as a measuring tool, as a measuring instrument for even the temple or for the religious services. Verses three to eight. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. These two witnesses, 
the Greek, of course, says the word martyr. These two martyrs will have sackcloth, which is the classic biblical sign of repentance, of doing a 180-degree turn towards the Lord, about not just being sorry for your sins, for your rebellion, for your missing of the mark, for your lack of per for perfection, for your lack of holiness, but actively and intentionally attempting and trying to cease doing those things which displease the Lord. The olive in the Greek language is a homophone for the word mercy. So every time we think of olive, we think of mercy. Eleon and eleos. The candle, as we went over in the Johnine literature, represents the flame, not the wax, but the flame, which has no shadow, no darkness in it, representing no evil. Now, a lot of people, though not everyone, thinks that this passage is talking about the prophets Enoch and Elias, or Enoch and Elijah, for whom I was named after. The two people of the Hebrew Bible, that did not see death. And so they believe this prophecy is meant for them to come back and actually to finally die, to get out of what in the Ethiopic or Gizrite tradition we refer to as Beherahiawan, the nation of the living or the living ones, and to come show their mortality, show their Ben Adamness, or their being sons of the groundling. Let's see what happens to them in verses 9 to 12. Whoever they actually are. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. So whether this is Enoch and Elijah, Enoch and Elias, or it is just two unnamed martyrs, you see that they are hated upon by haters in a certain time, temporarily, and yet they are vindicated by the life-giving spirit of God. Now comes the, woe, the woes for those who hate with uh, or who hate upon the slaves and the prophets of God or the martyrs of God. Verses 13 to 17. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Whenever I hear mention of the Lord and his Christ or the Lord and his Messiah or the Lord and his anointed, because I use the Psalms of David for prayer, I recall Psalm 2, in which we hear that Yahweh or the Lord is ridiculing those who try to plot and scheme against him and his anointed one, his Messiah, his Christ. It says that he who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. It's one of my favorite verses of 
the Hebrew Bible and the Bible writ large. Here in verses 13 to 17, we see that this same Lord is Lord of natural disasters. He is the universal God to be universally worshipped. He is the God of the past, the God of the present, the God of the future. There is a lot of talk of goats, the greatest of all time, and people abuse that term, and they keep changing their minds about who that is. The undisputed goat is God, is the Lord of hosts, who has control over all natural disasters. And we'll see that again in verses 18 to the end. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Throughout the Bible, we see that the various peoples are afraid of lightning because it can cause a fire in their village. They're afraid of thunderings, which are paired with that. They're afraid of earthquakes. We're still afraid of earthquakes in 2020 in, in the great state of California. They're afraid of hail because these things are out of their control. The legal code, even in 2020, calls these things an act of God. If a tree falls on your car or a lightning bolt hits it, the court shrugs and says it is an act of God. Here we also see the key idea of judgment, which is all over scripture. People try to avoid it. It's one of those features of Jesus that people don't like to talk about. But Jesus is a judge and he rewards his slaves, be they great or be they small, who teach and obey his instruction, his rod. And so we see that chapter 11 comes full circle, begins with the rod and ends with the rod. Glory be to God for all things.